This is CBC Saturday News. Residents on the Toronto Islands are working around the clock to protect their property after water levels on Lake Ontario reached a historic high yesterday. The water has since receded a bit, but with high winds expected tomorrow, it could rise again. Kelda Ewan is on Algonquin Island for us tonight. So, Kelda, how worried are residents about a surge? Well, residents say it's not so much the rain that they are worried about, which we are expecting some rain overnight, but it's the wind that is the bigger concern that could cause the surge. Now, I'm in front of Queen, Queen City Yacht Club, which has seen the worst of the flooding from earlier this week. Now, this, as you can see, the water levels right now are quite high. This was due to a surge just from earlier today. Now, if you look behind me, you see most of uh, the lawn is underwater. I was told earlier today that uh, you can see, see, actually see most of the grass, but now most of it is underwater. Now, fortunately, the clubhouse itself has remained dry so far, but it is taking a lot of effort. Uh, right now, the water level is at 75.93 meters. That matches the level in 2017. The residents and club members have been out uh, most of the day, continuing to build a line of defense fence along the shoreline. Now this is a historic 98 year old structure and they want to ensure it does not get damaged. Of course, residents are also concerned about their homes, but they say the pumps have been doing a good job so far. There are 30 sump pumps and 15,000 sandbags, but residents tell me it can go from dry to flooded within just 20 minutes if there is a surge. Last time this happened uh, about 10 days ago, um, some the waves, quite frankly, were knocking the sandbags, the filled sandbags off the wall. I mean, the, the water has a great power and we're, so that's what we're trying to protect against today. The strong winds tomorrow and on Monday are a big concern and we'll start reassessing things, how they're happening then, because we're expecting a lot of water coming over the walls from the harbour and, um, and we'll probably have to put a few more sandbags around this house. You'll probably be in a, 18 inches of water by tomorrow morning. Now, the island is, of course, much better prepared than in 2017. They began sandbagging in late uh, April. Now, residents tell me they're doing it more, also doing it more effectively in terms of placement, um, having learned from 2017. The city has also installed extra pumps, but the Toronto Area Conservation Authority does tell me that they do expect flood levels to rise even higher difference is that we're seeing more wind events this year in 2017 luckily during that time the waters were a little bit calmer whereas this year not only are we seeing that peak level we're seeing higher winds therefore we're seeing higher waves and in fact we are expecting to see water levels rise even a little bit more so we are looking to set a new record on Lake Ontario this year. Now, as you heard earlier from a resident, it's the northeasterly winds that are the biggest concern. So here at the Yacht Club, they have they are on 24 hour watch, making sure that all the pumps are working properly. And the residents I spoke to, they are hopeful that this will not be a repeat of 2017. Maribel. Still very tense out there. Thanks, Kelda. To Ottawa now, where residents are hoping the army of volunteers that stacked sandbags to protect their homes can now come help take them down. We're, we're appealing, we're almost begging them to come back and help us. We need the help. We cannot do it on our own. And they're already fatigued. It's been, you know, it's been a, a month and a half uh, pumping water and, and sandbagging, and now they have to remove them, so yeah. Saturday was the first day of a volunteer call-up, but there was a poor turnout. The city is taking the sandbags away as long as residents can get them to the roadside. Volunteer registration centers will be open across the city tomorrow and next weekend. The removal work will take place between 9, 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. A fire near the northern Ontario community of Pekanjikum First Nation has grown to about 3,000 hectares. It is under a state of emergency. As Karen Pauls tells us, Hercules aircraft have been helping residents evacuate to surrounding areas. Pekanjikum is now without phone or internet service and the chief is asking people to come to the school to get registered and scheduled for evacuation. Military Hercules planes are back in the air today. They're spending an hour or so on the ground loading up people, elderly, the young, pregnant women and those with medical issues. And they were expecting those people will be flown to Sioux Lookout to be taken to some of the surrounding communities. 
Yesterday, the military evacuated about 580 people using three Hercules from Trenton. They did six round-trip flights. A total of 869 people have now been flown out, and they hope to evacuate five to 700 people a day. I spoke to a member of one of the military flight crews last night when they returned to Thunder Bay. He thought the fire yesterday was a little worse than the day before. I asked him if it was hard to get into the airport with the fire just two kilometers away. There's a lot of uh, coordination with the water bombers and the helicopters that are assisting in putting out the fire. So there are times where we have to uh, give them a little bit of uh, leeway so they can get their stuff done and, and uh, make room for us to get in. Our staff are trained to deal In Thunder Bay, this really fire serious, chief worries this is just the beginning of a bad wildfire season. Wildfires will be a problem, I think, as they are every year. It's just when the wildfires are closer to communities that the evacuations happen. We heard there were some small rain showers overnight in the community, and everyone's hoping Mother Nature will cooperate with the firefighting efforts. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Thunder Bay, Ontario. People living in northern Alberta's wildfire zone are in for a long, hot struggle. Officials don't expect any relief from the dry weather for at least two weeks. Crews are doing battle with at least two dozen wildfires that have forced more than 10,000 residents from their homes province-wide. The mayor of Slave Lake says he is optimistic that town will remain safe from fire, but is concerned about lightning in the forecast. We're going to check in for our first look at weather with Michelle Mackey, who is back with us. It's nice to see you, uh, Michelle. And uh, Kelda was mentioning rain a concern for Lake Ontario and a bit of the wind, too. Yeah, I mean, from fires to flooding, weather is really dominating a lot of the headlines right across the country. But I want to begin with the rain that's in the forecast. Plus, we have thunderstorms as well. Continuing through early this evening, they might linger into tonight, but they should clear out by tomorrow morning. Still some fairly widespread severe thunderstorm watches. Conditions still favorable here for the development of thunderstorms, but you'll note that warning still in place from Long Point through to Simcoe. And when we look at the radar, we see why that is a juicy cell down towards the warned area. And we're now seeing the outskirts of western Toronto beginning to see some rain. And up along the 400, we just had a cell pass over that was producing some really heavy downpours, strong winds, and lightning reported there as well. Now, in terms of the rainfall, 15 to 25 generally across southern Ontario, that's going to end by tomorrow morning. But through southeastern Ontario into southern Quebec, that is going to linger into tomorrow afternoon as that system just slowly trudges to the east. And temperatures, they are once again going to be below seasonal as we head into your Sunday. Thanks, Michelle. We'll see you in a bit. The federal government is expanding a program that gives support to LGBTQ2 refugees who are fleeing violence and persecution. The Rainbow Refugee Assistance Partnership will increase the number of privately sponsored refugees from 15 to 50 per year starting in 2020. It's not a cap. It's a, it's a number that uh, we've arrived at in, in conjunction with the community. It's a recognition of the fact that um, that uh, we can do better in terms of resettlement and, and that is why we have a five-year commitment. And the pilot project launched in 2011 and provides LGBTQ2 refugees with financial support up to three months. The department is pledging $800,000 over five years to expand the program. Well, Pride Month officially kicks off today, and the festivities begin tonight with a launch party at Museum of Contemporary Art to raise money for Rainbow Road. It's been a difficult couple of years for the LGBTQ community in Toronto. As Ramna Shahzad tells us, for Pride Toronto, this month is about learning from the past. For me, Pride is all about just like celebrating life, celebrating yourself, being proud of yourself, and expressing that, not being afraid to show that to the world. Miss Fierce Alicious says she is ready for a month full of festivities. And while organizers say commemorating the LGBT community is always the focus of pride, this year they also want to bring attention to the birth of the LGBT movement, the 1969 Stonewall riots in New York City. 
Part of the reason Stonewall is so important is because Stonewall was the first time the LGBTQ2 plus community said, we want to be treated equally and we also want equal protection, not only under the law, but in the way those laws are policed. The arrest of serial killer Bruce MacArthur overshadowed last year's Pride events. A month that was supposed to be about celebrating this community instead became a time to mourn his victims, mostly connected to the village. Police were scrutinized for the way they handled those investigations. Nuama says the fact that it took years for MacArthur to be arrested and charged is proof that the message of the Stonewall riots still matters. We're celebrating 50 years of what should be equality, but what in fact continues to be an ongoing struggle for LGBTQ2 plus rights as symbolized uh, in Bruce MacArthur uh, and his decade long uh, serial murder spree. Again this year, police won't be walking in the parade. Activist Nikki Ward says the LGBT community has had plenty to heal from in the last year. As a community, we're used to tragedy, and we've experienced, I think, more than our fair share uh, recently with the uh, missing persons and the, the murders of those persons. Um, and so, yes, I think the community uh, as, as, as a whole, and Toronto as a whole, has uh, 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 responded very um, well with all the humanity, humanity that we expect from Torontonians. Another focus for this year, local talent. Pride Toronto says you can expect to see a lot of local artists, DJs, drag queens come back to their roots. You can also expect a lot of street parties. I'm honestly really excited for it. Pride is always a lot of fun. There's always so many events, so many new people that you can meet and it's just a fun time. Pride Toronto's opening ceremony takes place at City Hall on Tuesday with the raising of the rainbow flag. Ramna Shazad, CBC News, Toronto. Keep counting. Kawhi Leonard getting ready for game two against Golden State. Can the Toronto Raptors continue their incredible run? We'll check in after the break.
we're listening to the coaches. Uh, also, um, whoever has feedback, me, myself, uh, you know, Kyle, um, you know, whoever, Norm, Freddie, you know, Serge, whoever has feedback, we're listening and, you know, preparing for the next game and seeing what we could do better collectively. They got rings and they can be confident. Um, we can't really necessarily worry about them. We have to continue to worry about us. The Claw and Kalo, superstars of the Toronto Raptors, getting focused for game two against the Golden State Warriors. That goes down tomorrow night. It has been an impressive run so far. Can we get an encore? Well, fans certainly hope so. The NBA playoffs have captured the imagination, not just of Torontonians, but Canadians, and generated interest in basketball right across the country. Our Lorenda Redekop is outside the CN Tower for us tonight for a special reason. Lorenda, there's a treat in there for fans. That's right, and so I'm beside the CN Tower because this pop-up behind me, it's just opened up today. It's going to be here all week. You see the mirror on the outside. Well, inside, it's pretty much an Instagrammer's dream in there. Think about that infinity exhibit at the AGO. This is like an NBA version. So inside, there is an actual NBA Finals championship trophy, and uh, a few facts about that trophy. It's actually the basketball on it it's the actual size of a regulation basketball you do have to be 18 to get inside the lineup was pretty long earlier it's a little shorter now because they're preparing for a possible rain here uh, but for kids or for people who don't want to line up there is this other version of the trophy a little bigger fake version and we saw a lot of people taking their picture outside earlier and a few other other facts about that trophy, it was designed by Tiffany's. It's sterling silver, gold plated, and the NBA Finals trophy, it's not like the Stanley Cup where it's the same trophy being passed along every single year. Instead, this one, the teams will get one every year. So Golden State, they do have a few of those. The Raptors, they're hoping for their first one. And Raptors frenzy really has taken over this city. The eyes of the sports world are on the Raptors right now, with everyone wanting to make shots like superstar Kawhi Leonard, including players at this girls' basketball tournament in Toronto. What my coaches tell me to do, I see the Raptors do all the time. So it gets me really motivated because when you see something come into play, it really helps you, like, understand what you're supposed to do. And then watching the Raptors in the finals, which is amazing, it's just, it's so awesome and, you know, it's, I love it. Yeah, because they're like role models and then you always look up to them because they show you how it's done. And then <laughs> the very youngest girls are already working on their skills. The challenge for people who run girls basketball leagues is keeping their interest. Many players quit at around this age, 13 or 14, losing interest in sports. This league, Basketball World Toronto, is working together with the Ontario Basketball Association, studying what's happening. Unfortunately, it tends to be a, a smaller grouping of girls that are playing the sport, and obviously we're trying to elongate that in some way by just telling them this is a great sport to be able to participate. This league keeps growing every year, but still has just 50 girls, compared to 200 players on the boys' side. Women and girls are a big part of the Raptors fan base as excitement for basketball is everywhere in this city right now. This is an actual NBA Finals trophy. The Raptors hope they'll be the ones taking one home this year. And if they do, people expect that the sport of basketball will continue to grow in this country. They've been leading the charge. And so I'm always saying, hey, the, the further the, Raptor go, the Raptors go, the better it is for us. And hopefully we can keep Kawhi around and, uh, and, and you know, continue uh, on our way, not only one championship maybe this year, but also next year. And I was over at Jurassic Park earlier. The store right beside that area was so lined up. So many people, everyone's trying to get their gear. Game two, of course, it goes tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Maribel? All right, Lorenda, thank you. And one player the Warriors will be locking in on when they play tomorrow night is Pascal Siakam. It has been a long road for the Raptor, affectionately known as Spicy P. He once dreamed of being a Catholic priest before basketball became the center of his life. Devin Haru has more on his incredible journey. The starting lineup for your Toronto Raptors! 
The NBA Finals are always the grand stage for the game superstars, but on this night, did a new one emerge? Unfazed by the hype and the glare, Pascal Siakam was simply brilliant. Pascal daring him to shoot in the three. Making 14 of the 17 shots he took, he was everywhere. And a nice post up move that time. Leading the Raptors to a huge win. That's the story of my life, just going out there every single night, um, working hard to get to this level. A life that's had its heartache and adversity. In 2014, at the beginning of his basketball journey, attending a U.S. university far from his Cameroon home, Siakam's world was rocked. His father killed in a car accident. It was definitely one of the toughest moments in my life and kind of tested me, you know, as a man. Devastating, but Siakam persevered. The Toronto Raptors select Pascal Siakam. Suddenly in this, just his second full season, breakout success. He's been given a God-given ability of having a big engine. No French questions? What's going on? Fluent in both English and French, Pascal has a flair fans adore. You keep coming to the, the Warriors, he's, he's, he's on Gagné. Earning him the nickname Spicy P at a Cameroonian restaurant in Toronto today. We call it Achu. All the talk about their hero. Pascal, we want to say thank you so much. I want to tell you, keep on with this name. We'll be behind you. We'll support your name always. Pascal drives. And during the game of his life, his dad, the one person on his mind. I know, you know, people always usually tell me that I know he's proud of you and, and you know, I have a bigger purpose and, and, I, and I play for something bigger than this basketball. Pascal and the Raptors now just three wins away from an NBA championship. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Ottawa is opening doors this weekend for their annual Doors Open event. After the break, we'll show you how one site is displaying a prototype that could revolutionize the way we build a house. Stay tuned.
This weekend, more than 100 local buildings in Ottawa will open their doors for a rare chance to see what goes on inside. One of the places welcoming visitors, Natural Resources Canada's laboratories. They will display a new prototype that could revolutionize how cheap and quick building a house can be. It's called the Rapidly Deployable Northern House. It was built by hand in four days by four people with no experience in construction. The prototype is designed to help communities in the north build houses fast and cheap with limited resources. Ottawa's Doors Open event will continue throughout the weekend. And drivers beware tomorrow as tens of thousands of people are expected to take over two major highways in downtown Toronto for the annual Ride for Heart event. Stretches of the Don Valley Parkway and the Gardner Expressway will be closed for the 32nd annual Manulife Heart and Stroke Ride for Heart from 2 a.m. to 3 p.m. The DVP will be closed in both directions from the Gardner to York Mills and the Gardner will also be closed both ways from South Kingsway to the DVP. Closures are also expected around Exhibition Place. Commuters are encouraged to take alternative routes or public transit. So those festivities get uh, underway very early tomorrow morning. We're back with Michelle Mackey now. You said rain showers expected early in the morning tomorrow. Yeah, we could easily see some showers lingering into tomorrow morning, but hopefully by the time riders finish up that big long ride, we should be in the clear. But it is a bit of a commuting nightmare tomorrow for all of our weekend workers because of course, down near the Scotiabank Arena, it is going to be mayhem as the Toronto Raptors take on the Golden State Warriors for the second game in the NBA Finals. Hoping for another win, of course. And I mean, sports fan are, or not, Canada, we are so united behind our Raptors. At tip-off, 12 degrees under sunny skies. That's some good news for folks heading out to Jurassic Park. But by and large, this is below seasonal, and here's why. As we look to the upper levels of our atmosphere, we are trapped in an upper low, and that is continuing to cycle below seasonal air right through the first week of June into the GTA. So as we look to Monday, not a bad day by any means, Toronto at 15 degrees, but the thing is, we should be around 22 at this time of year. We're slowly going to creep up as the week progresses, but the price we pay Tuesday afternoon, watching for some showers to move through. Still a bit of cloud cover expected on Wednesday, but watch your temperatures on Wednesday. We jump right back up to seasonal, bang on at 22 degrees. And then for your Thursday and Friday, looking like we are finally going to see a clearing just in time to get us excited for the weekend. But as we look to Saturday, rain in the icon, but we're still a few days out. At this point, that could change. We'll be watching it over here at the Weather Network. Finger, fingers crossed with you. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> 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 and that is our show for you tonight. But before we go, we want to show you a new art exhibit that opens today in Toronto. It's called The Fun House. Local artists are paired with musicians to create and design their own space. It is super Instagram worthy, so be sure to keep your device handy if you head over. Thanks for watching. Have a great night, everyone.